Hello and welcome. This is Jim Carp with Raymond. I'm with Danielle Matley and Don McAnally. Danielle, we haven't had a chance to chat before. Can you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. Like Jim said, I'm Danielle Matley. I am a Raymond Healthcare Advisor out of our Detroit office. I work in our Accounting and Finance Solutions Department, and I'm just glad to be here today. Okay, welcome. Hey, Don, you and I were talking about the HHS stimulus payment pack last week, and you've got some updates, and mm -hmm. you brought Danielle along with you. So why don't you kind of lay things out for us, and we'll kind of unpack this. Certainly be happy to. Jim, you know, we've been talking these last couple of weeks. There's so much happening out there with the CARES Act and how it's impacting businesses, in particular medical practices. Danielle and I wanted to talk a little bit today about how this is impacting and what's happening with the Health and Human Services, the HHS stimulus payment that came out a few weeks ago. Um, Jim, this is all part of a $50 billion allotment out of $100 billion that was allocated to the Provider Relief Fund from the CARES Act, okay? The initial allotment for this, Jim, was sent out to all Medicare eligible facilities and providers that were impacted by COVID. Okay. okay. Funds were originally allocated based upon 2019 Medicare collections and now have been recently updated to be based upon self reported and verified 2018 net patient fees. Now, where this is really going to help some practices is those that uh, don't have quite as high of a Medicare practice. So they might have OBGYNs, you know, pediatricians where they're not seeing as many Medicare patients. This is really going to help them now because it's turned around and it's based on 2018 net fees. You know, Danielle, we were talking amongst our healthcare advisor group about this. And, you know, we saw some practices getting significant amounts of money. You know, I have a, uh, you know, specialty practices that neurology, uh, ophthalmology, that we're seeing a lot of money. But then we noticed it was interesting. Like you mentioned, we noticed some practices that weren't getting any, you know, a pediatric practice, unless they're dealing with, um, you know, patients with kidney issues, they're really not going to bill Medicare at all. So they didn't really see much money under this, did they? No, nope, not at all. So this is really going to help them. You know, Jim, another one was OB-GYN practices. You know, typically, you know, the average patient there is not of Medicare eligibility. So they didn't see much money out of this either. So you know, when we were talking with our clients about this act, you know, those that were in those specialties were, didn't really know this, you know, what had happened here. Um, and really the thing was kind of a surprise to many practitioners out there. We remember back on April 10th, it was a Friday. And Danielle, we started to get phone calls on this, didn't we, from clients that were getting money in their accounts. It's a little bit of a surprise that day, waking up and seeing some pretty large deposits in those accounts that they weren't expecting. Yeah, so this one kind of flew under the radar quite a bit. And, you know, some clients got some surprises on April 10th. Now, you know, we were making clients aware of this and we let them know that these monies were coming in. One of the concerns we got is that, you know, many clients got it, but some didn't. And so there was some intrepidation out there as far as, hey, when are we going to get this money at all? And, you know, it worked out there. The biggest tranche of the money went out on April 10th, but the second came out on April 17th on two different Fridays they came out. So I think the vast majority, if not all of our clients have received this first allocation of the 30 billion. But what was interesting today, you know, is that there was this $20 billion fund that came out that's going to be allocating some more money on it. So, you know, Danielle, what are your thoughts on that? So yesterday, HHS came out with a press release late in the afternoon about what they were going to do with this initial 70 billion, the addi additional 70 billion. So originally they said maybe it would go to hospitals, maybe harder hit areas, but now they have this 50 billion allocated to the general fund. So our practices are going to see this initial additional 20 billion coming out next week. Yeah, so we had, you know, 30 billion came out first and went to some institutional providers, you know, Jim, your hospitals that you would typically think of that are accepting Medicare. Then we had a lot of physician offices get this money. We had some physical therapy practices get these funds. And then we had some DME practices, durable medical equipment, Jim. They got some of these monies too. And so now what, what Danielle and I found is that there's going to be this extra, this next segment of $20 billion that's going to come into here. There's going to be some reallocation. The first $30 billion was based upon, like we said earlier, Medicare collections. And we said, you know, there's a lot of providers out there that don't bill Medicare. So they really didn't get the piece of the pie that probably they should have. Okay. And so this one's going to be based a little bit different. The allocation methodology is going to be a little bit different. Danielle, I think it's going to cause some confusion. You know, comment, can you, what do you think of this allocation methodology that they've got going on? Yeah, so what they're going to do is go back and redistribute the whole $50 billion based on this new methodology. 
So if you got a larger share of the first 30 billion, you might see a smaller share of the next 20 billion because it's reallocating based on the 2018 net fees. So no portion of it will be based on Medicare fees any longer. So that's going to create some confusion. When the money first went out, it was based upon Medicare revenues. And I think people understood that. I've had several discussions with clients today regarding this to say, you know, they're, they're concerned that it's, or they're thinking it's going to be based upon 2018 Medicare fees. I've had to tell them, no, it's based upon your 2018 revenues, which then, which then begs the next question. What does that mean? What are 2018 revenues going to be? Daniel, you and I have talked about that and, you know, we're still not sure, are we? No, we're not sure. You know, we really kind of think maybe it's going to be your 2018 tax return filings because that's what they can verify off of. So it's going to have to be something that they can fact check and double check your information. Right. There's going to be some verification process that goes through this thing. You know, there's going to be some concern about fraud and how it all works. So I think I think you're right, Danielle. They're going to have to go off of the tax return. So, you know, an important thing our clients are going to need to get together is a copy of that 2018 tax return so that when they go to apply, and Danielle, they have to apply for this thing, I believe, when they apply for it, they have the, that information available to them. So if I, can jump in, if I can jump in here really quick then. So I think what I heard first is sometimes people were surprised that they were getting the money, and now I'm hearing that they have to apply for it. So can you clear up that, that uh, statement for me? Yeah, so the additional 20 billion that's gonna go out, they're gonna distribute two ways. Automatically, if you filed a CMS cost report, if you did not file a CMS cost report, you have to go onto a portal that's going to be open by HHS probably this week, maybe next week, and verify your information to be able to get a portion of that $20 billion. Okay. That so, you know, Jim, a cost report is, some, is a reporting that's going to be filed by largely institutions. You know, you're looking at hospitals are going to file cost reports. Perhaps some senior care centers are going to file cost reports. But most of our physician office-based clients, physical therapy practices and such, they don't file cost reports. Okay. okay. So mm -hmm. hearing that, you know, you've got to file a cost report, you know, some of them don't exactly know what that means. And it can create some level of confusion to them saying, Hey, wait, I got to find my cost report. What is my cost report? No, you don't need to have a cost report to get a piece of this money. If you don't file a cost report, which the vast majority of our clients don't, it's utilizing income information from 2018 is really going to be the golden ticket to this thing. Okay. How, how about the money? If once, once we get the money, is there further clarification of what I can use the funds for? Yeah, there's a handful of items that you can use the funds for. They have to be COVID related. So they can be expenses related to COVID. So how you prevent and uh, prevent your office, maybe putting up plexiglass when you reopen, uh, maybe you're buying PPE equipment, maybe you're looking at um, different ways to reconfigure your office so that your waiting room is socially distant or lost revenue. So a lot of our practices have slowed down, shut down maybe, they can't do elective procedures. So it's really gonna be offsetting that lost revenue or expenses to prepare for COVID. You know, Jim, we've seen a lot in particular in the state of Michigan, but other states too, where they're having a shelter in place and then, you know, the governor's closed down a lot of non-essential type practices. Um, elective case volumes are down significantly. So the, the offices that are open, largely on an emergency basis right now, you know, patients are kind of scared to come into the office right now. This is really a surreal time for many people. And so they're seeing their volumes go down significantly. I was, I was speaking earlier today with an ophthalmology client of ours and talking with them and, you know, their volumes are way down, as you can imagine. Really, it's just largely emergency type cases that are coming into the office right now. And you know what these clinics are doing is they're starting to develop new policies, new procedures to make sure they're in place when when the you know when the doors do open back up and when things kind of return back to normal. You know how are they going to test people that come into the office? You know what kind of protocols are they going to put in place to make sure that their patients stay safe, that their staff is safe, and that they're safe? You know there's a lot of unknowns regarding this whole thing and how things are going to come back to normal. It's kind of going to be a wait and see as we all put protocols. Many are looking to, you know, the AMA to provide some protocols, maybe the state medical societies, the American Dental Association, the Michigan Dental Association. I think it's a good thing as you're getting back to the point of opening up your office, Jim, that you contact your professional societies, you know, listen to them and the guidelines and the protocols they put out for it. So. Okay. So, so in addition to those protocols, now we were talking about what you could use the funds for. Are there areas that you should not be leveraging the funds for? Are there anything earmarked that you can't touch? 
Yeah. So when you're accepting these funds, you're apply or you're attesting to some terms and conditions. And one of the main ones is executive level salaries. So you can't use the funds for any um, administrators, physicians, anyone making over one hundred ninety seven thousand dollars a year. So that's the main one that you can't use these funds for. Uh, the other thing is with all these different stimulus packages out there, you can't use the funds for anything else that you were able to have reimbursement for. So a lot of our clients are out there applying for these PPP loans and you, those cover payroll, rent, utilities, things like that. So you can't double dip. So you can't count the same expenses towards the same different programs that you're applying for right now. Danielle, this is a really important one that I could see that I can see providers and practices out there perhaps needing some guidance on. You know, when you look at this, you know, a vast number of, of you know, physicians will earn in excess of the $197,000 figure you mentioned, but they're going to be impacted this year. Lost revenues, right? We've got less patient-based, non-elective cases being, being, you know, occurring, and there may be a temptation to use some of this money to, you know, to provide or boost physician compensation or in other examples that they might look at this to you know supplant other monies, like you mentioned, the Paycheck Protection Program here. So this is this is an important aspect to be aware of, I think, for our clients that they're that they're using these dollars in a very appropriate way. So okay, so so when you talk about leveraging the dollars, and then that goes back to then accounting for them. So what are your thoughts on making sure that you've got everything buttoned down? Documentation is going to be key here. Document, document, document. Make sure you have your different sources of funds, potentially open up separate accounts to keep these funds in so that you can track how you're using them. Make sure you know what you use your PPP funds for and have separate documentation for that so that if and when you get audited, you are able to kind of substantiate how you used all these funds. You know, Danielle, there's so much going on right now with all these different stimulus packages and you're right, document, document, document. You know, our physician clients are very used to that in their medical records. And, and so I think they can understand the importance of doing this right now, but this is from a financial perspective, probably one of the most important things that they could do is to document how they're using these monies at this point in time, whether it be for PPE, whether it be to help manage their overhead, and, and hire employees back, whatever the case may be, they need to document. They need to make sure they understand how these dollars can be used. You know, I, I think we're going to see a lot of people that are going to want to, you know, maybe put it towards executive level compensation. That's going to be a significant no-no for use of these dollars. So we're going to need to watch that very closely. So strategy up front, make sure you understand where the dollars are and then keep track of them and then document it. Okay, great. Now, I know a lot of times a, a challenge for a practice is billing. And now you've got COVID in the mix and you've got all these dollars floating around. Any recommendations along those lines? You know, the CARES Act really brought up some new unique billing um, stipulations that you have to consider. So I think the president is really trying hard to make sure no patients are surprised by COVID related bills. They want to make sure that patients can be treated, can be seen, can get tested. So in the CARES Act, they have to um, really look at and see how their billing is affected by this. You know, one thing that's in this terms and conditions sheet that they're attesting to is that if they see a patient that's out of network and it's COVID related, they have to treat them as if they're in network or else they are in breach of these funds. So there's going to be a lot of things that they have to look at and make sure that they are applying to this new rules to make sure they're in compliance. Yeah, it's really interesting what Danielle mentioned. I think the, you know, a, a big intent of this whole thing is to make sure that patients are seeking treatment if they're feeling, you know, if they're feeling any of the symptoms of COVID. Okay, federal government I think has done a good job of of making the funds available so that people don't avoid having treatment done. Okay, and so they're really trying to incentivize people to have that. Danielle mentioned, you know, all patients are considered in network at that point in time, so you can't balance bill a patient. Okay. So you can't look to say, hey, I no longer participate with that patient's insurance. Therefore, I'm going to bill them. That's not the case. You know, the government's done a great job of working with many of the, ma the major nonprofit and commercial insurance carriers to make sure that everyone's functioning together in this pandemic environment. I think it's really important that we all do. And they want to make sure that money isn't an inhibitor right now for treatment for people right now, because that will really be cataclysmic in what we're trying to do here. So. Okay, so covering the billing then, what about attestation? Where, where's that headed and suggestions you have? 
Yeah, so if you receive these funds, you're required to attest to these terms and serve conditions, and you have 30 days to do so. If you don't attest within 30 days, it's deemed that you have attested to them. So if you choose not to attest, you are in effect attesting. So it is very important to make sure you're reading through what you're attesting to, knowing kind of what you're signing up for and filing the required form. Don, what do you think about that? Anything you else? Know, Danielle, there's been some changes in these attestation terms and conditions. <laughs> you know, when they first came out a couple of weeks ago, you know, Jim, to be honest with you, we were concerned about them. You know, a lot of CPAs, a lot of healthcare consultants, a lot of attorneys that deal in the medical area, there were some strings in these terms and conditions that made us pretty uncomfortable. I had several discussions with clients as we were going through them and we were thinking, how can we attest to this? You know, some of the things that they were asking about, if we were ever challenged as to how we met this term and condition, how can we do that? So we were really challenged with this. And, you know, and the whole spirit of this is to really make sure that providers are able to stay operational so they can treat people, right? That's, mm -hmm. the, whole in, that's the whole intention of the Provider Relief Fund is to make sure that providers have the financial resources to continue to be able to treat people. But there's no such thing as a free lunch, Jim. And so we're a little bit concerned about these terms and conditions. You know, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that, that they've been updated. Thank goodness, I think HHS has received some comments back on some of them and have said, hey, you know, we need to look at these things. Maybe we need to not be so difficult in some of these terms and conditions. So they have, they have changed some of them. But Danielle mentioned something that's really important is that this attestation process is that you have 30 days from the date of receipt to review that. So within some of the pages that we've done within Raymond's Economic Response Resources team, we provided some of those links and we're gonna to continue to update that so that clients can get that information and know where they have to go to, to understand the terms and conditions and how they can attest to them. Danielle, there's some reporting that's gonna to have to be done on this. You know, I'm a little bit concerned about the reporting. What kind of thoughts do you have on that? So yeah, if you receive more than 150,000, there's gonna be some additional reporting requirements but we still don't know what those look like. So we're still watching the HHS page, looking out for any updates and we'll keep our clients posted when we know anything more. But right now we, we still don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, except for the fact that there will be reporting. So, you know, for those making over 150 or getting over 150, Danielle, we understand there's gonna be specific reporting that's necessary, but I understand too, that for those that receive less than 150, which are a lot of practices, right? there still might be some reporting on that. I believe that the Secretary of the Health and Human Services, HHS division, and you know, the, the terms and conditions say, or as, you know, reporting as prescribed by HHS. So that's a real open item right there. And that's really gonna impact small practices, right? They're gonna have to have those policies and procedures in place to track these monies to support their use, aren't they? Absolutely, HHS actually came out and added a paragraph to their website today specifically about this saying that all recipients will be required to submit documents. What documents those are, we don't know, but it will impact anyone, not just the ones receiving those larger amounts. Hey, Danielle, we've had a lot of discussions within our, within our healthcare consulting group about accounting for this and how we're gonna help our clients manage this. One of the things we've talked about is setting up a separate bank account. What do you think of that? You know, I think it's gonna be really important to have that segregation and having that money kind of be set aside and pulling on it as you use it so that you know how you're using those funds. If it gets commingled in your bank account, sometimes it can be really easy to look at your account and say, oh, I've got a lot of money here. I'm going to spend it. But if it's really segregated and separate, it makes you kind of think and, you know, you really hold yourself accountable to how you're spending those funds. Yeah, remember, Jim, this is not, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program or the Triple P program that we've been talking about is a forgiveness program if we use the money in accordance with the grant. This is different. This is not This is not a forgiveness program right here. So it's a completely different program. But even with that, we think it's a good idea that you know you you put some barriers, some guardrails around this the usage of this money, so that the practice understands how it's using it and highlights it within their financial reporting models. Okay. So so with with the funds that come out, there's always strings attached, and and you were talking about fraud and making sure that you track and do all this stuff. So it's probably fair to assume some people are going to get audited. And what would you suggest that they do to make sure that they're all set? There is going to be some audits going on. So HHS has said that there's going to be some anti-fraud and auditing work done um, with help from the office of the inspector general. So just be prepared, you know, know that it's coming, know that it's a possibility. 
educate your billing department, have them ready and know that they're practicing consistent practices across the COVID related billing. Uh, make sure your um, patient financial responsibility form, you might wanna look at updating that so that your patients know what they're signing off on and then document and make sure that you have that in case of an audit. Yeah, it's gonna be really important, Jim. I don't think we want practices to run in fear of an audit. That's never a way to really operate in a business environment. But nevertheless, you need to be aware that at a future date, someone might be looking over your shoulder to take a look to see how you spent the money. And it's going to be a good, it's going to be a great idea. It's a great practice for, for our clients and our practices out there to make sure that they're doing what they can to show that they use this money appropriately. I think it's the public's money. It's the public's trust that needs to come with it. So, Okay. Well, this has been very informative. Any final parting thoughts? You know, I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot is contacting your Raymond advisor. Uh, I think they've got a wealth of information. They've studied all these financial impacts, whether it be the stimulus package here with the relief grant, the Paycheck Protection Program, or the Medicare Advanced Payment Program. There are three different programs, and there's other programs out there, too, that you need to be aware of. And I think contacting your Raymond Healthcare Advisor is a great start there to make sure that you're gaining all the access and benefit you can of these programs during this difficult time and, and also that you comply with these programs so you can make sure you're doing it right. I would echo Don's comments exactly. I mean, there's so many programs out there and they're intermingling and they're, you know, a lot to them. So contact us, we can walk you through them. We can talk through what you got, what you didn't get, what you applied for and how, how to spend it in the best way possible. Hey, we're all gonna get through this together. We're going to work together to make sure it all happens. So appreciate your time with this. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Danielle and Don. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Take care. Thanks, Jim. Yep.